And all of a sudden you have a hippo doing a power roll. Hello, I'm John Rossi. I'm a touring drummer with a passion for animal conservation. When I'm on the road, I spend as much time as possible visiting zoos, aquariums, and conservation organizations. Now, I want to share those places with you. I'll be talking to keepers, vets, conservationists, anyone who can help me in my mission of connecting my people to animals through their people. Join me on my raw safari. Hello, 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 and welcome back to the podcast that, as soon as you saw it was in your feed, you went, Hippo, Hippo, hooray, the Raw Safari Podcast. Yeah, I'm a dork. But I'm a dork who's happy because this week we are celebrating with our friends at Adventure Aquarium as they celebrate Hippo Awareness Month. Okay, okay, stop cheering. I'm trying. Guys, hey, guys! Thank you. Yeesh, who knew that all of the fake people in a digital crowd noise simulation could be so dang annoying? Anyway, y'all, I am really excited to bring you today's episode because you are going to get to meet two of my favorite non human animals in the world. Heck, they're actually two of my favorite animals, period, including human. And those are Jenny and Button. Now, Jenny and Button are the hippos who live at Adventure Aquarium, and, uh, you know, this whole week is focused on getting you to be aware of them, so this podcast episode is a great way to do that. But I cannot stress enough how cool these hippos are. And uh, guess what? Not only are you going to get to learn about them and some of the other animals that live with them, including the fact that it's a mixed species exhibit with a species that is going to blow your mind if you don't already know what it is. Um, But you're also going to get to come behind the scenes with me and meet them. I've got some audio of when we went back uh, before the aquarium opened to the area where Jenny and Button live when they're not on exhibit. And you'll get to hear some cool moments that I got to share with some amazing, amazing hippos. I'm really excited for y'all to hear that. Uh, But before we get to that, we should probably tell you to make sure that you are following along on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Raw Safari, on TikTok at Raw Safari Pod. Hit subscribe on whatever podcast app you're listening to and all that jazz. Cool. Yay. Got that out of the way. All right. So, um... I mean, I think I really just want to get to it. So uh, without further ado, here is my interview with Sean Danner, who's going to help us celebrate Hippo Awareness Week at Adventure Aquarium. All right. So why don't we start off by you telling me who you are, where we are, and what you do here. So my name is Sean Danner. I'm a biologist, too, here at Adventure Aquarium, and I'm one of the primary keepers for our two female hippos. Yeah, you are. Um, And the hippos here are? Their names are Jenny with a G, uh, short for Genevieve, and Button. Well, yeah, I I, I knew that part. I was going to say, the hippos (laughs) here, you're very excited, I appreciate that, are like the thing. Oh, yeah. They are definitely our, our largest animal. Yeah, and and so well known, and and Jenny and and Button are, um, I mean, they are legends. You know, we 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 we're talking about sharks and we're talking about sea turtles, and it's an aquarium. But really, I know that when I get back to town from being on the road, one of the first things I need to do is go see Jenny and Button. Like that is just absolutely. essential. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm excited to share a little bit about them. Um, and we will get to them, but first I want to start off with you. So tell me a little bit about how you got started in, in this industry and like, did you always want to play with hippos when you were a kid? <laughs> um, so hippos were never really uh, part of the plan. Okay. Um, when I was younger, I think the originally the one memory that always come, kind of pops into mind was first grade, having to make a poster about yourself and it had all the questions you had to fill out. And I always remember first grade knowing dolphin trainer wanted to work with animals um now obviously to know not working with dolphins but hippos are closest living relatives are whales and dolphins okay so you know nice. pretty close they're just big land cetaceans I <laughs> exactly <guess. laughs> pretty much um so 
I started out, I, I did go to a school for psychobiology um, up in Maine. And after college, I moved back home here to South Jersey. And I started volunteering here at the aquarium, actually. Um, I had two other part-time jobs while I volunteered here uh, for about seven months. And what were you doing as a volunteer? Um, I was actually volunteering over with the African penguins at the okay, time. Okay, cool. Uh, so I was over there quite a bit. Um, got to kind of wander around the aquarium and peek in at other animals as well. Uh, but after about seven months of volunteering, I became a uh, biologist aide here at the aquarium. Um, and that was a little over 11 years ago now. Wow. All right. Very cool. So you said you studied psychobiology. Yes. And I'm going to assume that that is not the biology of psychotic animals, though <laughs> some would say that would work with hippos. It, so, it could definitely apply. <laughs> so what is the difference between, I mean, I know what psychology is. I'm assuming that's where we're coming from. Yes. I know what biology is, but I've never heard of psychobiology, and I really like that title. So. Yes. Uh, I had actually never heard of it either. I started out marine biology. Uh, after one semester, I actually switched over uh, because of an English class. We had to write an English paper on anything about our major. And every topic I looked at was based kind of on behavior. Okay. And I realized that was really where I enjoyed uh, the aspect of animals. And so I ended up switching over to psychobiology, which was a brand new major at my school. Um, so it's more so of um, my concentration was actually in animal behavior and ecology okay. within the, that realm of psychobiology. Uh, there's lots of different kind of subfields within it. Uh, but it's kind of more so the interaction of biology and psychology and how they kind of mesh together and can affect one another. Well, that's really cool. Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, and so then, then you were here and you became a biologist. Yes. And what did you start working with or when you did the biologist aid or whatever the position you said? <clears throat> so um, as a biologist aid, I was just kind of um, almost like a relief keeper. Um, other, other places will call it. Um, and I worked amongst the bird and mammal team. So I worked with our parrot collection, a lot of our ambassador animals, uh, the penguins, of course, and our hippos. And at the time, we also had seals. Oh, okay. So kind of a jack of all trades. You're kind of everywhere, wherever you're needed. And just kind of helping out everybody. That's interesting. I love hearing about places like, so I moved down to this area about seven years ago. Okay. And so I, I never saw seals at Adventure. That's pretty exciting. Yeah, yeah we used to have uh, three harbor seals and three gray seals, which are uh, native to New Jersey. Okay. That's really interesting. Very cool. Um, and so then you you moved up through the ranks and and you just stayed with that team this whole time, basically. Is that correct? Yeah. So over the years, um, I slowly moved up. And as you move up, you kind of become a little bit more specialized. You start to oversee certain areas. Um, and as I was coming up, I was working with a lot of the trainers with the hippos. And we were doing a lot of training, which is definitely one of my biggest passions is the training aspect. And something opened up in hippos. I happened to get it. And uh, I absolutely love it. That's awesome. That is so cool. And uh, I really want to spend a good amount of time talking about these two girls and what their life is like and um, all of that stuff. So let's start off. Uh, when, when did they come here? So both hippos came here uh, late 2004. Okay. And then they went on to the exhibit uh, early 2005. Okay. All right. Um, and I would assume that there must have been a lot of work done to get ready because that is a, very hippo specific exhibit. Absolutely. Um, so can you talk about that at all and what kind of thing like goes into figuring out how to bring hippos to an aquarium? Yeah. So that whole side of the building was built um, and they knew hippos were coming. They built that exhibit especially for hippos. Nice. Um, one of the really cool facts about that side of the building and prepping everything for the hippos is when you're walking around that side of the aquarium, you don't necessarily have a good feeling of where you are in relation to the land. Right. Uh, but you are on the second floor. No. The hippo exhibit is on the second floor. I know that I can't argue with you, but I kind <laughs> of want to. I'm sure that you're right. But no, I've been here hundreds of times and that makes no sense to me. Yep. Wow. That's really interesting. So uh, okay. we have a freight elevator that was built specifically right next to the hippo exhibit. Uh, so our hippos did have to go on an elevator <gasps> ride to get to their holding area. Wow. Yeah. That's, I'm, I'm still confused by that. But okay, I believe you. I believe you. I figure you're not lying to me. Um, and so, okay, so this entire thing was designed. Elevator placement, exhibit placement. Um, 
I assume from just what I've seen that hippos are messy. Yes. So what yes. kind of filtration goes into that whole situation? Uh, it's a very large filtration system. Uh, the main filtration system is actually located below the hippo exhibit. So a lot of the water runs down there. Uh, but uh, back in 2004, we realized, you know, with just how messy hippos are, we need more filtration. So they added a completely different loop to that exhibit, which is actually on the floor above the hippo exhibit. So we have hippo poop water running below the exhibit and above the exhibit. <laughs> um, so we have two huge loops on a filtration for this exhibit. Um, one of them is a, a very brand new type. It's very efficient, but we find even by the end of the day with two hippos in that exhibit, clarity can still go down with just how much poop and just based on their activity in the exhibit. Yeah. Yeah. It, it definitely is. Uh, I have, I have, Oh, hundreds, if not thousands of photos of those girls and maybe a dozen where you can actually see them. <laughs> <laughs> Got to get here early. First thing in the morning that, that water is crystal clear and blue. Um, Typically around two o'clock or so, they start getting a lot more active. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, if they sleep all day and are really chill, that water stays nice and clear. But as soon as they start moving around and really pooping, then yeah, that's when uh, this ability goes down. <laughs> Understandably so. So let's talk about each of the girls. Let's start off with Jenny. All right. So Jenny, she is, uh, she is 21 years old at the moment, and she is weighing around... 4,600 pounds. Ooh, that's, that's big. So she is a big girl. Um, so we always kind of equate her to our dog. Okay. Uh, she, we get a bucket of food and she is ready to go uh, <laughs> for training. She wants to come over. She's going to see what's going on. Um, so she's definitely a, a fun little personality. Um, and yeah, just the sheer size of her is, is impressive. Yeah, uh, when she's standing next to Button, the the height difference, the size difference, it's it's immense. Absolutely. Tell me a little bit more about her her personality. By the way, I have to tell you that one of the things that cracks me up the most is I've been doing this podcast for shy of two years now. By the time this comes out, I think it'll have been two years, and I have learned about hundreds of animals. And about 90% of them are either dogs or cats. <laughs> it's like, oh my gosh, this is 4,600-pound hippo. It's a dog. Okay. It's a big puppy. Good, good. Good to know. Good to know. But, but tell me more. Tell me, really, like, who is she? So she is, she is definitely our attention hub. Um, loves attention not only from her keepers, but also from just the general public. Um, we find her at the window quite a bit before we do any of our educational talks, she's there waiting, just <laughs> watching people. Um, if you have ever seen the hippo here bouncing up and down at the underwater view window, I can almost 100% guarantee that was Jenny. Uh, she will sit there and bounce up and down, draws attention to her, and then she's able to just sit there and watch people. Uh, so she is very much our people watcher. She's the one glued to the window, checking everybody out. Um, when it comes to training, she's a very smart hippo. Um, but she can be a little lazy sometimes. <laughs> um, so we'll go to do stuff and she'll try to, you know, work her way around some things. Uh, she's smart enough to be able to do that. Uh, so sometimes she'll try to find out, you know, what's the easiest way I can do this. Interesting. Yeah, that's cool. And then let's talk button. She's cute as a button. She absolutely I is. I assume that's where the name came I, from. I can only assume. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yeah, she's our smaller one. Uh, she is... 25 years old and she's weighing in weighed around 3,200 pounds. So That's a pretty big difference. Pretty big difference between the yeah. two of them. Um, so despite that size difference, uh, she's a boss. Nice. Um, nice. She will definitely let Jenny know what's going on. Um, they both get along very well, but you can imagine anybody living with anybody 24 seven, you're going to have your spats and disagreements. Um, and sometimes it's over favorite foods. Sometimes it's over favorite toys. Um, and we have definitely seen, uh, button make some grumbles and head tosses at Jenny and Jenny has uh back to the, the dog analogy but <laughs> I've seen Jenny kind of in the corner like a scolded puppy like oh no button yelled at me <laughs> um but she is very very intelligent um she is very uh I almost say analytical she likes to figure everything out okay so whenever we do new training with her it's very much trying to lay out each step and showing her what's going to happen doesn't like surprises. She likes to know what's happening and what's going to happen. 
So if you're able to kind of lay all that out and show her with no surprises, she loves to sit there and kind of put it all together. Um, she is to the point where she will read your body language and all of that and kind of try to be a step ahead of you. Um, with new people, she will sometimes kind of treat them like a substitute teacher. Okay. Um, and so they do know us individually. Right. right. Um, they'll both test new people, but Button definitely will try to test them a little bit more. <laughs> and it takes a little bit longer for our newer keepers to really build that rapport with Button because she definitely does have to work up that trust. When, once she trusts you, she's amazing. But uh, we have to really warn new keepers of letting them know nothing you did. Button's just, you know, she has her wall up and she's, you know, going to test you. Uh, but you said to kind of build that trust with her. And it takes a bit longer than with Jenny. That's really cool. I love, I love the individual personalities. Oh, yeah. It's, it's such a cool thing. Um, so you talked about training. Yes. What do you train a hippo to do? Oh, all kinds of things. Uh, so most of the behaviors that we do with them, we call them husbandry behaviors. It's stuff that we simply teach them to better take care of them. Uh, so something as simple as opening their mouth. Um, yes, it's great that they can open their mouth and we can throw food in there. Uh, but also it's great because we can check their teeth. Um, not only check them, but we can use a rotary tool and actually grind down any sharp edges and take care of their tusks. Oh, wow. Okay. So we can go right in there and you know, tusk, dust flying out uh, it smells horrible <laughs> but they're totally fine for it you know a person you would probably have to sedate to go and grind in on their teeth but the hippos are completely fine it's all voluntary uh but they know how to lay down back up let me pause for one second before yeah. we keep on there um do tusks like grow continually is that a yeah that so they will continuously that? grow throughout okay. their life um their bottom tusk they also have one on the top and they actually rub against each other oh so that way they don't get too long uh, but just like people, the wear, mm -hmm. everyone's bite is very different. Mm -hmm. So even just looking at Jenny and Button, vastly different shapes of their tusks, uh, just based on their bite. And yeah. Jenny, at one point, got a little sharp edge on top, caused a little bit of gum irritation. And that's when we started doing uh, the grinding. Right. And, you know, it maybe takes five minutes once a week and no more irritation. Oh, that's so cool. So, so I did not realize that hippos are rodents. <laughs> <laughs> I kid, get, I the, kid, get the bunny ears out around Easter. <laughs> <laughs> no, very cool. All right. So now I, I just needed to clarify that because I, I, I thought that was fascinating. I did not realize that, that their tusks grow forever. That's really cool. What, uh, yeah. So let's talk more behaviors now. Uh, so, yeah. So they know, you know, backing up, laying down, um, even stuff out on exhibit. We can do targets where they'll put their nose to a target and they get a reward. Um, we can do that on exhibit even through the window. So we can put a target on the window. Oh, nice. They'll put their nose to the other side of the window. We can move them around. They'll even open their mouths out there. Uh, button will even go underwater on command. Really? Uh, we kind of use the down, the lay down behavior. Um, and now she just offers it up. And, you know, she's like, oh, this is cool. Jenny, on the other hand, uh, she's not quite figured that out out there. Um, we have some pretty comical pictures of me trying to see if I could, like, Get as low as possible for her to follow me. So there's pictures of me literally laying on the ground <laughs> and her just staring at me like, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> so it didn't quite work that way. Um, but one thing that we do with, uh, with Button is we give her a uh, one behavior that she has is coming into a chute. She's a little nervous with that back door being shut on her. Uh, so with her being analytical and wanting to know everything that's going on and what's going to happen, uh, we actually give her the choice. So she actually has full control of when that back door shuts now. Okay. So we give her two options. Um, we give her her normal target. If she touches her nose to it, she gets a very basic little treat. Um, but nothing happens. But then we have a cake pan that we have red electrical tape on. So it looks vastly different than the normal target. If she picks that, she gets her favorite treat, which is honeydew. So okay. very big reward. Okay. But she knows that means that back door is going to shut. So some days she comes in is totally like, yep, shut the back door. I want that big treat. Other days she comes in, it's just, nah, not today. So she actually has 100% control over that whole situation based on her mood that day. So that way we're not surprising her. We're not doing anything that she's not comfortable with. Um, and by having her have that, uh, that choice and that control over the situation, uh, she's really blossomed. And it's kind of a new way that we've been able to kind of better kind of communicate with her mm -hmm. um, and it's really helped in every aspect of, of 
care with her. I love that so much. <laughs> Training is so cool. It's the best. So um, I, I assume that when, when you say you're talking about the, the gate closer, you're talking about when she's going back to holding like an off exhibit, correct? Yes. So we have the holding area in the back. Uh, We have a chute in the back Mm -hmm. uh, that can close both sides and the sides can even articulate in. And it's also a scale. Oh, nice. So they get weighed every single Wednesday. Very cool. Very cool. So I I have a couple of questions about that. First of all, when they are uh, behind the scenes, Mm -hmm. do they still live together or do they each have their own space or or how does that work? Uh, So it can work however we need it. All right, we'll be back after this quick break. Hi, this is Kathy Hill from the Indian River Lagoon National Estuary Program. We're all about restoration, projects, and progress this season on One Lagoon, One Voice. Learn about the great strides the lagoon community is taking to restore and protect the Indian River Lagoon. Each week, we dive deep into discussions with scientists, resource managers, and nonprofit leaders to explore lagoon issues and solutions. From oyster reefs to clam restoration, algae blooms to muck, you'll learn all about the projects we're tackling to bring the Indian River Lagoon back to health. Click the link in the show notes to follow One Lagoon, One Voice, learn about the IRL Council, and explore our unique lagoon. Um, So typically, they have full access to each other, um, and we have the back area wide open. Uh, But we have the opportunity to, we can separate uh, the land portion and the water portion back in holding. Uh, so in the morning, typically we will separate them for our training mm-hmm. simply. So if we're training with Jenny buttons, not coming over and pushing her way in and trying to insert herself. <laughs> um, and same with, you know, Jenny trying to come over and steal some food. Uh, so that way we can really just focus on one another. Right. Um, but typically, it's wide open, so they have full access to each other all the time. Neat. Very cool. And you said that they have a water area back there as well? Yep. Okay. So we have a, a pool in holding nice. um, as well, so they pretty much have access to their water 24-7. Okay. Very cool. Very cool. Um, now, I, I notice that Jenny is a girl mm-hmm. and Button is a girl. Yep. And now I don't have any fancy psychobiology degree. <laughs> But it seems to me that that would make it hard to have little hippos. It would, yes. So it, it, I, I'm curious about a couple of different things with that. Um, first of all, why no baby hippos? But then also, <laughs> um, as far as, um, you know, keeping them, you know, I know about, we, we all, if you listen to this pod, you know about the SSP and all that yes, stuff. Yes, absolutely. Um, are these two going to be lifetime residents here? Are they out of the SSP? Is there a chance that they will get a breeding wreck at some point? Not with each other again, obviously, but you know, like what is the deal with all of that? So right now they, they are part of the SSP. Um, they, right now they are not currently uh, recommended for breeding. Um, they'll most likely be lifetime uh, residents here at the aquarium. Uh, so they actually both came to us from Disney. Okay. Um, so right now, yeah, they are not. Wait, they're animated hippos? I right? thought they were real. <laughs> oh, you've, you've seen Fantasia, right? <laughs> Back in holding, you can find their little tutus and everything. Yeah. <laughs> we have to do a lot of washing of them. Uh, but yeah, so right now, uh, yeah, they are not recommended. So yeah, they'll be most likely they're going to be a lifetime residents here at Adventure Aquarium. Nice. And speaking of that, what is a, a lifetime for a hippo? So typically, uh, in zoos and aquariums, you're going to find them living typically into their 40s and 50s. Okay, so you're like, talking a good amount of time. Oh yeah. So yeah. typically, you know, right now, right now, 25 and 21. You know, so they're going to be here for quite a bit longer. That's awesome. Very cool. Uh, so in general, you know, we're talking about these two specific hippos, mm-hmm. but hippos are kind of scary. Yeah, actually. <laughs> um, what? What can you tell me about like what steps are taken to make sure I know that you guys train? I know that y'all have relationships, but I also know that I'm not seeing you out on exhibit with the hippos. Um, so, so just kind of talk to me about how you stay safe with these, these guys. Yeah. So we work with them. It's called protected contact. Uh, so pretty much just means that there's always a barrier between us and the hippos. We never share the same space as them. Um, now, even though we don't share the same space, you know, by walking into their area, we still do have a lot of direct contact with them. Uh, so, like I said, we're in their mouth, grinding down their tusks. <laughs> uh, now, that's a two-person job. So one person literally just has a hand on their snout. And it's kind of just a them having their hand up there, asking them to hold that open behavior. Uh, but also, they're kind of gauging the tenseness of their jaw. 
Okay. So you can imagine being at the dentist. How many times does your dentist throughout the entire process ask you wider? Because you're just right. not really knowing you're closing your mouth mm-hmm. a little bit. And that person can kind of feel that in their mouth. And they are kind of talking to the person who has their hand in there, uh, <laughs> who's very focused on what they're doing. That way we just have extra set of eyes and extra sense of what's going on with them. Um, another way that we have really direct contact is uh, we're working on voluntary blood draw nice. from Jenny. So into that shoot I was talking about earlier, she'll walk right in. We can close her in. She has a keeper up front uh, who puts her into position. And then I can go around back and actually have full access to her tail uh, where we're attempting to draw blood. Uh, so just ways that, you know, it's definitely different from working free contact with an animal where you can just walk right up to them, walk all the way around. Uh, so with protected contact, it definitely adds some um, some difficulties and some some a lot of strategy to where you can get and also a lot of the behaviors that we teach them gives us access to different parts of their body so jenny and button both know hip so they will come parallel to the bar so we can get access to the full side of the body even if they aren't in the shoot so okay. that's lots, really lots cool. of ways around it right that's really <laughs> cool i know i've gotten to interact with a few rhinos um, okay same type of thing always protected contact but you can reach through you can touch you yep. have to be careful and aware of where that horn is but yeah but um (laughs) yeah that so it's it's kind of that similar thing where you can be tactile without being risking your life exactly so even if your hands go through you just have to be aware of where are they in relation to the barriers and the body because you know last thing you want is even if they shift not on purpose but they can shift and trap your arm or you know put in a very precarious situation so there's lots of safety when it comes to animals of that size because it doesn't take any ill will from them. It can be a complete accident, just them moving that much body weight. That can be very dangerous. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. Um, and, you know, mentioning how they move and how dangerous they can appear. I one time was here, and those two were going at it. And I don't know if they were fighting for real or if this is how hippos play, but I have to tell you, Sean, <laughs> I have seen a lot doing this podcast. And I don't think I've ever been more, I wasn't scared, but intimidated. Yeah. They are, they will fly at each other. They are so fast. They are so strong. Talk to me about what that's like when they get into it. And and is that, you know, in general, do they play that way? Or is that, you know, settling? Uh, and like you said, when you live together 24-7, like stuff will happen. I know that they have oh, a yeah. great relationship and I, I want everyone listening to, to understand that. But but when something happens, you know, what what is that like for y'all? And, and describe it to my listeners. Uh, so what you were probably seeing was play. Okay. Uh, so yeah, they will play fight. They will open their mouths at each other and kind of bite it, you know, at their mouths. Uh, they will chase each other around. Um, it's they, they will flip each other over and they're in the water. Yes. Since they can't swim, they'll be mid water column, and the other one comes up, and all of a sudden you have a hippo doing a barrel roll, <laughs> little legs kicking, <laughs> and they have no control over themselves out in the water. Um, so yeah, that was play, and you, but yes, it looks terrifying. Um, you know, just like, you know, once again, back to dogs. You'll hear dogs mm-hmm. playing. Sometimes it can sound horrible, but sometimes some dogs are just very vocal. So, yeah, the hippos going at each other, full mouths open. Um, if that was a real fight, you would know. Gotcha. Um, hippo fights out in the wild, they are no joke. Um, you will definitely see a lot of damage done to both hippos, typically in the mouth, because they will go mouth to mouth. Mm-hmm. Um, we might find a small abrasion or something like that in their mouth, but Typically, when we find that, it's usually because they were just chewing on a toy too hard. Gotcha. Um, so, yeah, that was probably more so play. When they kind of settle their disputes, it's much quicker. It's usually just a quick toss of the head or a grumble or, you know, some kind of vocalization. And then it's usually over. Um, so sometimes we'll have them come over for treats or meeting people. And one kind of will toss a head, give a grumble, and the other one backs off. So. Typically, an actual dispute between our girls is over like that. Okay. Uh, it's very quick, whereas the more prolonged stuff is more so actually just this play. Was really prolonged. Yeah, I could not. Oh, yeah. like I said, I've been here hundreds of times, and I've I've never seen any. That was amazing. I yeah. mean, the water was splashing like all the way into the air, and oh yeah, were, like flying around each other. And as high as that that acrylic is, uh, we have seen water splash over that before. Uh, Jenny will even partially porpoise out of the water 
Oh, and, wow. And um, when she's running around chasing Button or, you know, running from Button, she'll hit a high point and she'll jump up. And, yeah, she will have Corpus out of the water. And water goes everywhere. And we will sometimes get calls from our engineering department because of how much water they're moving around. <laughs> it splashes away from the filtration so much that it sucks a little bit of air. So they're gotcha. calling like, what are you doing in hippos? And it's like, well, we're not doing anything. <laughs> but uh, expect this for the next, like, 15, 20 minutes, though. <laughs> Amazing. That's that's really cool. Yeah. Um, on a side note, just because this is Hippo Awareness Month and I, I want to raise awareness of all hippos, do you know about the cocaine hippos? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> can you can you share anything about the cocaine hippos with my listeners? <clears throat> so from what I'm aware, um, it started out as a very small population. Um, but you know, hippos are native to Africa. Yes. Uh, but there is a very small but growing population down in South America. Uh, so Pablo Escobar was a big, uh, big fan of animals, and he had himself a little zoo. Um, and when he was no longer in power, uh, some of those animals were taken and sold. Some were released. Um, he had a couple hippos. They were just released into the wild, and they have bred, and their numbers have grown and grown. And hippos, even in Africa, really don't have any natural predators. Um, their biggest threats over there are humans and you know climate change. Uh, and down in South America, they are the same thing. There's nothing really that's going to hunt hippos. So they've kind of just been breeding and growing, and they're a bit of a nuisance animal down there. Yeah, There's been lots large of large, <clears throat> yes, large, large debates on um, how to solve it. Because um, obviously, you know, yes, they can cause a lot of damage. You know, around here, you always hear about different um, different animals that don't belong here, invasive species, and technically. A hippo in South America is an invasive species. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> but yeah, it's definitely an odd story. We get we get asked that every once in a while, and sometimes we ask like, "Oh, is Africa the only place they're found?" And it's like, you know, you kind of gauge with the guests of do they want to hear about this? Like, they seem like they would enjoy a good story. So sometimes we'll we'll, we'll talk about that, and they they love hearing about that kind of thing. Sometimes, so yeah, it's, it's definitely an odd story. And they're, they're talking right now. There's like, you know, proposals of sterilizing the population, but then also how do you do that in the exactly. wild? And yeah, it's it's a fascinating. Yeah. Um, yeah. Weirdly, Pablo Escobar was not AZA accredited. No. Um, shockingly. <laughs> Followed all the other rules. I don't know why that one. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's it's an interesting conundrum right now. For yeah. Sure. So, um. You know, Jenny and Button are the stars of this episode. Yes. And, but they they have another animal that lives in a mixed species exhibit with them. They do. And the first time I saw this animal in with hippos, I legitimately was like, okay, wait. Did an ambassador animal just get in <laughs> with the hippos? Because that can't be right. But it is right, and they are happy and 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 friendly and get along. And yeah. I, I need you to share this with with my listeners. Yes. So um, out there on exhibit, uh, typically about four days a week, um, we have a Cape porcupine uh, named Theodore. Uh, we call him <laughs> Theo, and he lives out on exhibit. Um, free contact, so there are are no barriers. He has places where he can hide if he doesn't want to deal with the hippos. Uh, but he has free contact out there roaming the exhibit with the hippos. He's about 45 pounds, uh, about two and a half foot quills. Uh, so he is very large, but in comparison to the hippos, very, very small. Uh, so he is out there. We see him go nose to nose with the hippos. Uh, Jenny is particularly infatuated with him. When we first did our introductions with him a, a couple years ago, uh, we would always joke about how Jenny just absolutely loved Theo. We, you know, best friend Theo, we would call him whenever uh, he would go out onto exhibit with Jenny because uh, she would just follow him around and be right up in his business, sniffing him. And he never really seemed to care. If he gets too bothered, he'll put his quills up. And that's usually a good sign for the hippos to back off. Um, but, I mean, I've seen him walk underneath a button uh, to get the food. He'll go right up and steal food from right in front of them. Uh, if they have a nice little treat of like honeydew or butternut squash or something like that, he'll go right up. He's not afraid to steal food right from the hippo's face. Okay. How 
did y'all come up with the idea of shoving a 45 pound and I mean, goodness gracious. I get that we usually do mixed species exhibits from the same area, yeah. but it's a porcupine and hippos. Where did this come from? And how did the person who came up with it not get laughed out of here? <laughs> well, I, I'm not sure who the initial person who had the idea was. Uh, so Theo is actually our third porcupine of the species that we packed. Uh, we had two that were here when the exhibit opened. Uh, they have since uh, passed away, unfortunately. They were not pancaked, right? <clears throat> no, no. They lived, they lived well beyond their life expectancy. Right, right. Nice. Uh, so they lived <laughs> till the ripe age of, uh, I think they were like 12 and 13 years old, which is pretty old yeah. for that species. Um, and then we had the opportunity to get Theo. Uh, and we actually got him from another zoo uh, here in New Jersey. They had uh, a litter of two. And we were able to get one of them, and we got him at actually only a couple days old. Nice. So we actually bottle fed him and Aww. took care of him from a very, very young age. A lot of a lot of effort went into that. And so introductions with him was probably a little easier than the original two, but still had to take all the precautions of introducing at first, just sense. So we would take stuff that he had peed on, put it onto the exhibit, and let the hippo smell it. We would take some hippo poop, take it up to him, that way he could smell that. Uh, next step was just visually. So we would bring him down and put him in a little corral, or we would put him on his leash because he is harness trained. Nice. Uh, so we can walk him around, and we would take him down there just so the hippos could see each other. Um, I mean, obviously, they had seen a porcupine before, but Theo had never seen a hippo. Right. Uh, the biggest thing he had ever seen was us. <laughs> so it's definitely, uh, I'm sure it was a bit of a shock at first, but he responded great. Uh, didn't really show any fear. Put his quills up a little bit if they made any sudden movements. Uh, but eventually, yeah, he went out there on exhibit and we just almost laughed at how easy it was because, like I said, Jenny was just all about him and followed him everywhere he went very cautiously, but just sniffing and everything. Just almost wouldn't leave him alone. Never aggressive, just super curious about everything he did. That's really adorable. <laughs> I love that so much. Me, <clears throat> me and the other keepers have we've even joked, uh, uh, Thought like, oh, this would be a good kids book, you know? Yeah. Jen, Jenny and Theo, button in the background. Um, I may have even made a little uh, theme song for the two of them. <laughs> oh, I mean, the mic is open. We have lots of original goofy music on this podcast. I'm just saying. Just saying. Oh, boy. Didn't think I would be bringing this up or <laughs> throwing myself to the wolves to uh, sing the theme song. Um, but like I said, why not? His name's Theo and he's my best friend. It'll be that way until the very end. There's also Button, but she's around the bend. I'm Jenny, he's Theo, and we're best friends. Boop. <laughs> Boop makes it, yes. Okay, I have to tell you. So I know you haven't had a chance to really check out the podcast yet, but I do this kind of thing all the time. Nice. You are the first guest I have had. <laughs> Who has done it, though. So you fit in yes. so well right now. I mean, my, my day job is that I'm a touring musician, and I work in musical theater. A lot. Oh, well, perfect. So I do this goofy stuff all the time. Yeah, <clears throat> they're parodies on parodies. Awesome. Yes. No, oh, yeah. My uh, my fellow keepers are going to, uh, they're going to be bent over laughing at, at that. <clears throat> I'm so happy right now. <laughs> so I, we will literally just be doing nothing, and I'll start humming that right and then you know they'll just be like oh no <laughs> now it's stuck in my head so i will sometimes also purposefully start singing it just to get it trapped in my co-workers head which they hate <laughs> <laughs> that was amazing this might be my favorite episode i've ever done i don't know but, uh, that's incredible there we go like i said embarrassment yeah. <laughs> oh man. So um let's take it back for some more hippo facts. Yeah. Um what is their uh like red list status? Uh so right now they are listed as vulnerable. Okay. All right. Cool. So they are vulnerable. Um and while what we're talking about here are the the, the hippo hippos, the what you think about the hungry hungry kind, if you will. Yes. Um only less plastic. Um <laughs> there are also pygmy hippos out there, there which are. are which are endangered. How closely related are they? Um I mean they, they're relatively closely related, but um, there's vast differences between them. Smaller. Um, even just way smaller. <laughs> um, even just kind of looking at the shapes of their faces, um, it, you know, 
just very, very different looking. Um, but yeah. Cool. And I know that you mentioned the tails get used for blood draws, but they get used for more than that. Oh, they do. Oh, yeah. Um, so I'm sure people who have seen videos of hippos, there's definitely a very famous one of uh, Splatter Zone. Um, so yes, hippos will, as they defecate, they will swing their tail around. Um, if you look at the shape, it looks like a little paddle. And they can really launch uh, that poop. And they can launch it pretty far. Um, so males will definitely use that to spread their scent over a large area. Um, just so they can, you know, if you're going to poop one spot. Instead of just sitting there walking and leaving it in one spot, uh, they can splatter it and launch it over a much larger area to kind of say, this is my spot. Okay, and so that's why we think it's a territorial thing? Just yeah, like, mostly okay. and males. Um, females do it as well. Okay. We've had ours do it, mainly Jenny. Um, but with her, sometimes it's a bit more of a kind of a jealousy thing. Interesting. So it's never uh, just because. Uh, so it'll seem like we'll be doing training with Jenny, maybe 15, 20 minutes, doing all kinds of stuff with her. Then we'll switch over to Buddy. And sometimes Jenny decides that, well, she still needs more attention. Uh, so she will back up to the uh, the doors or go over to the wall and not only just poop, but she will use that tail to spread it around and launch it around. Um, and she can get some pretty good distance. Some of our shelving units have uh, some plastic on the side <laughs> to protect the things on the shelves. Um, we have cleaned it off of the light fixtures and the pipes above them. Um, so... Yeah, they can get some good distance on it. So uh, <clears throat> when you're cleaning hippo poop, it's not a uh, one-dimensional cleaning the floor. Uh, you're looking in every direction. Wow, that's uh, that's entertaining. Yeah. <laughs> uh, is there anything else interesting that you can tell me about hippos in or you know in general or the girls in particular? Um, I mean, I think the uh, one of the biggest shocker for people is learning the quickness of them. Um, you see an animal that large, and you really just think that. You know, they're big and slow. They lumber around, which most of the time, that's what they're doing. Uh, they can run between 25 and 30 miles an hour. Wow. Um, and even in the water, they can move extremely fast. Um, like you, you saw them kind of going at each other. They can push off and really get moving uh, through the water column. Um, another cool thing, I think, is just their vocalizations. Um, they can vocalize in registers that we can't hear. Okay. So they can get very, very low. Uh, which is great for that uh, will travel very long distance. Right. But not only are they vocalizing to each other above water, they can do it underwater as well. Um, so they can be underwater. You'll see bubbles come out and you'll see the other one react. Um, we've even had the chance of having our hand on the window and you'll see bubbles come out and you can feel the vibrations in your hand against the window. Oh, wow. So it, you know, if they're, under there and bubbles are coming out. It's not them just releasing. You can definitely tell there's vocalizations because you can feel the vibrations moving through the water and actually into the window. Oh, that's so, fascinating. Yeah, that was a very, very cool experience to actually be able to feel them talking to each other. All right, we'll be back after this quick break. What if I told you scientists discovered a hundred new species in the deep ocean? Why did crocodiles survive extinction? Megalodon. How did it go extinct? Hey, it's me, Boris Galante, wildlife biologist. You might know me from Joe Rogan's podcast or my various TV shows like Extinct or Alive and Shark Week. Join me and my friends as we dive into the wild world of animal anomalies and everything wildlife. Don't miss out. Click here to uncover these mind-blowing animal mysteries. Wow, I love that so much. Very, very cool. Awesome. And then while you're over in that area with... um with two hippos and a porcupine, which I still just can't quite wrap my head around. Um, you also have some ambassadors and stuff over there. Right? Yeah. So so tell me about, just to pick a couple of cool ones. Uh, I know there's a pretty special pancake tortoise. Oh, absolutely. So we have uh, we have quite a few different uh, education animals, and we have two reptile exhibits over um, in the same area as the hippos. Um, so yeah, we have uh, some near mastics in there, and also we have two pancake tortoises. Um, so they are... I believe those two pancake tortoises are the oldest pancake tortoises uh, in the country. Wow. Uh, very so I cool. believe they are both in their 40s. Sure. Uh, so Gertrude and Louise. Uh, so they're over there. Um, they will climb all over the exhibit. They get into spots where it doesn't seem like a tortoise would normally be able to climb yeah, to. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, but also they will be mid eating and just decide I'm full and I want to nap and that'll be the spot where they fall asleep. So they'll fall asleep <laughs> literally in their food bowl, which is fine for them, but maybe the other animals, you know, I'm sure they it's mild inconvenience have to eat <laughs> around the tortoise, but I'm also just so proud of y'all for not having pancake related names for these two. <laughs> I think those are the first two pancake tortoises I've heard of that don't have a pancake name. So thank you for that. No problem. <laughs> I've been wanting to name something Gertrude forever. And finally we got the tortoise and it was just like, all right, let's do that one. And That's we a good name. thought Louise would go well with it. So, so yeah, no, no food, no food with those animal names. Nice, but. nice, yeah, yeah. And anyone else over there that's that's worth a quick mention? Uh, so obviously Theo uh, on exhibit, but yeah, he does. He's kind of strange, and we can walk him around. Uh, we have a prehensile tail porcupine nice. named Gonzo. Oh, nice. Uh, so he is very cool. Um, so he will come out on programs as well, um, and aptly named Gonzo because probably a good half of his face is nose, so yep, he yep. is named after the mother. <laughs> um, on top of that, we have a very large. Uh, black throated monitor named Khufu. Uh, he is right now probably around three and a half, four feet long. So he is a very big guy. Uh, also harness trained. Nice. So he wow. will also go on walks. Uh, he can he could eventually be five or six feet long, weighing around fifty pounds or so. So we wanted to start training him and have him ready for when he is that large. Uh, right, but right. yeah, some some impressive and very fun animals over there. Very cool. All right. Well, um, are there any conservation organizations that you'd like to give a shout out to? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So for uh, Hippo Awareness Month, um, the money that we raise, not only in that month, but throughout the year, we donate to the Turgway Hippo Trust. Uh, they're located over in Zimbabwe. So they're a great organization that we've been working with for several years, um, and they help protect the population of hippos over there. Uh, so they will work with local governments to make sure that, you know, rivers aren't dammed up in the wrong spots, um, working with, you know, legislation and things like that. But also they hire rangers to help protect them from poachers during droughts in the dry season. They make sure that there's enough food being brought in to feed the hippos. So, you know, in past years, our donations have gone into pretty much bringing in relief food for close to a year. I believe one year they were able to buy a new truck for patrols and just everyday things there. So um, uh, our donations that we give every year are, are a big part of uh, the donations that, that they get. So uh, they're a great organization and we've had a great relationship with them in the, the years that we work with them. Awesome. Love it. It's time now, don't you know? We've come to the end of the show. But there's one tale left to go. You're gonna laugh and say, oh no. It's time for the Rossifari Poop Story. So the Rastafari poop story. Poop story. So there are a lot. We definitely talked about some of the gross things um, <laughs> with the hippos. Um, so one thing that we do in the exhibit, obviously when the hippos are in the holding area, but we do scuba dive their exhibit in order to clean everything. Um, and there is always some leftover poop that the filtration doesn't uh, push over. It's much better now, but in my early years, you know, we would go down with a vacuum and vacuum up piles of poop um so we do thankfully have a full face mask so our <laughs> whole face is protected so it's not just like we have a regulator and getting poop water in there all the time uh but obviously you know you need to get a nice hot shower afterwards and in the early days there are plenty of times you go up to shower and in your hair you start picking out strands of undigested or should i say partially digested hay oh, um no. which you know obviously hippo poop uh, so as you're showering, you're literally picking little bits of hay and stuff from the water uh, out of your hair. So uh, definitely a, a messy job. So oftentimes just completely submerged in it. Wow. All right. <laughs> awesome. Very cool. Thank you for taking the time to do this. I really appreciate it. Oh, not a problem. Not a problem. Great talking to you. <laughs> All right, let's go and meet some hippos. Okay. But you can see all those molars are set really far back in the mouth. Yeah. So a lot of the first movements of them uh, moving their mouth around with food, it's just trying to get it back to the molars. Okay, interesting. Oh, you have <laughs> lots of leftover from breakfast, don't you? Yeah, a little bit more. There you go. Hi, Barton. It's so good to meet you. Oh, Baby, 
Slurping. <laughs> then there's Jenny over there. Hey, Jenny. Oh, wow. I didn't even see you sitting there. <laughs> so she's sometimes uh, they, they, they know exactly their timing. Right. So they know it's about time to go out on exhibit. That's really impressive. And that's impressive. they're going to get quite a bit of hay. Um, so they sometimes are like, it's the time yet. <laughs> <laughs> so you came right over for some treats. Oh, my gosh. Hi. <laughs> hey, bud. Good job eating. Big old mouth. <clears throat> yeah, they can open their mouth about 150 degrees. Okay. So just about a straight line. Then you have those tusks. They're pretty much pointing pretty much straight forward at that point. <laughs> wow. Yeah, you can get right in and shut up. Pull. So we can get, so you can see right there, mm -hmm. how those two tusks rub against each other. Yep. And that helps keep them ground down a bit. That's fascinating. Yeah, we always have these nice big barriers. But yeah, like I was talking about, we can come right in, we can touch them, we can go inside their mouth, get that ground down. <clears throat> um, yeah, she'll, they'll present their, their backside along the bars there. Um, they back up, they lay down, they do all kinds of stuff. And then back through that door, live in mine. Uh, that's the pool. Right. So that get actually gets drained every day. Okay. So just based on the size and how much poop they're putting in it every day, um, to put a filtration on it, it you turn it into a roller. So that gets drained. We go down and we squeegee the poop into a big pile, pitchfork it out, hose it all down, disinfect, and then we fill it back up. Fun. Every day. We're <laughs> literally ankle deep. <laughs> so how much do they eat way. in a day? Uh, so right now, we're thinking about 40 pounds of food. Wow. Each. Okay. Most of it's going to be Timothy Hay. Okay. Um, just watch your stuff. Yeah, of course. So you got to say hi to Jenny. Hey, Jenny. What are you doing? Oh, you're pouting. so big. So you get a pretty good look at the, at the feet there. Yeah. <clears throat> they, do have, they do have toenails on there. Um, it kind of looks like it just blends right in. But... That's really cool. Oh, oh really? Hello. <laughs> so do you hear her coming behind you? Oh, or do you? Oh, oh, oh okay. We found out what we have. <clears throat> so yeah, you can see even just her much yeah. larger tusks. Uh -huh. um, and yeah, she has like a, pretty much a flat back to it. Just the way that top one looks. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Big open. You can chew that. Go ahead. <laughs> She's like, but there's more there. Ah. <laughs> uh, there you go. That's some more. <laughs> oh my gosh. You're a goober. Chew it up. You got your hair. But... <laughs> you behaved well and actually came over to say hi, right? <laughs> Doesn't that deserve a little more? Troublemaker. One more. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> yeah, Jen, Jenny's on a bit of a diet now. That's fair. That's fair. <clears throat> Even though, a little spoiled this week. We went big before the diet with birthdays. Well, birthdays <laughs> are important. Oh, look at all that. She hair. stole both. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Like, like, I have a little bit of squash. I'll take the water. <laughs> That's amazing. Hi. Uh, <laughs> huge, but super friendly. You know, they love they love attention. Oh my Hi. goodness. Yeah, you good little girl. You know what? Yeah. I've met Fiona, and you're cooler than Fiona. <laughs> you are. Whoa. You are. I agree. Just say it. She's say. tiny and adorable, but come on. Yeah, come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you oh, all drooling. So good to meet you two. Some things we sometimes you do painting right there, so <gasps> she can put her face through, and we can put paint on, and she can press against the canvas. Um, she can also, when her head's up like that, we'll just press like you can see. There's bits of paint right. still up here. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> oh, and with that's her, so cool. she's actually not all the way through yet. And yeah. She can go. <clears throat> Okay. Yeah. So, like, sometimes we'll open up the chute, and that one's always open. Okay. So we always warn people like the chute's open, everybody, because 
she can stretch like this far through. <laughs> so it's like, watch where you where you're walking. Oh, she might good. pop out. She never chomps really quick. Okay. She's always very slow and deliberate. She will close her mouth very quick with things. So we're way more cautious about doing anything like that with butt. Fair. Fair. <laughs> Oh, look at all that hair. Oh, my gosh. But <laughs> some bits of carrot in there. You should eat your food, Goober. <laughs> you like seafood? <laughs> oh, that's so gross. And then sometimes we will catch, uh, we'll catch snot rockets from these guys. Nice, nice. Um, been launched in the face, sneezes. And yeah, I, I did catch a little bit of that melon that I threw threw into Jenny's mouth. Came back out on me. <laughs> I, I it hit me briefly. Oh yeah, but yeah. yeah. Lots of saliva. Yeah. Um, especially when they're eating the hay. The, I've only seen it one time. I think it was just perfect timing. But their saliva glands. Yeah. Imagine hitting a water fountain button. Oh wow. From both sides. I was just like, what am I looking at? <laughs> so, lots of saliva. No, she'll look like you sometimes. <laughs> Like some, where's your tongue? Oh my gosh. Where is it? It's not heavy, but she has really a lot of control over it. But especially when she's um, around over here, you can put your hand under there and she'll lick you. Aww. Stick her tongue out. Oh, do you two a little bit more? Good job. Yeah, gross. We gotta let them out. Oh, it is. All right, so we can go back over here. Cool. Uh, you can watch them go out. If you want. Yeah, amazing. And this, um, this is actually the crate that they came up the elevator with. Nice. Uh, nice. So when they were shipped up, the crates were much bigger, but we knew they weren't going to fit the elevator. So this was built literally for the elevator elevator ride, and then to ride up into here, and then they pretty much uh, the first scene at Jurassic Park. Okay. Yeah. The rafter. Yep. Yep. Hook it up to the door down there. Both doors were open. One walked out. Went back down. Did the, did the other thing. Nice. All right. Everything good. Okay, so we often talk about, um, you know, the kind of stuff used for shifting and everything, and I thought I would just let this play out so you can actually hear what it sounds like when two hippos get released onto exhibit. <laughs> That's me giggling as they walk out. I love how the keepers all say goodbye to them and tell them to have fun and stuff. That is adorable. Oop, here comes some loud noises. And this is all what it sounds like when these things happen. It's kind of fun to hear, huh? More loud noises, obviously. That was a softer loud noise for those paying attention at home. Amazing. Awesome. So cool. <laughs> so very cool. Oh, from the, the hydraulics? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not long for that long. That's I was going to say, I'd rather listen to that than the parents. <laughs> yeah. <That's laughs> By a lot. Yeah. 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 That's so true. Even, I, with, um, even with earplugs, it's like. Oh, yeah. I mean, like I said, I'm, I'm a professional drummer. It is what I do for a living, and I do not play soft. I am a heavy-hitting player. <laughs> and um, the first time that I was in a bird room featuring a ton of citizens, mm -hmm. I was in physical pain yeah. by the oh, end yeah. of it. And I was like, this is it's amazing. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. It's I will horrible. crash cymbals all day, every day, and then you put me in a room with a couple of parrots, and I'm like, ah. Yeah. <laughs> like, some people will be around them and not wear any ear protection at all, and I don't know how they do it. It yeah. depends on the day. There are some days that they're like just chit chatting and it's fine. And then there's some days where it's like alarm call and you're just like, <laughs> okay. Yeah. And it, it changes based on the day too. Like who's on exhibit and who's up there. Right. So like we right. might have parents that love you. So they're going to be like, oh, hi, hi. And you know, other ones, you know, Trinidad's up there today. I'm there. And every time I walk by the thing, <laughs> screams at my face. So so like, <laughs> McCall loves girls. Yeah, we saw him on exhibit. Yeah. Oh, he screamed as they walked by. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, he just like nice. the ladies. And then you got a few who like the men who will do like sweet little trills. And I'm up there and they're like, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> I hate you. Who's the one who's talking all the time? Because Maddie sends me these videos in the background. They're like, hello. Hi there. Hey. Macbeth. Hey. You guys, you guys. 
So I feel like, I feel like so it's thought. a yellow named Amazon or African Grey, either or. If it sounds more boyish, Dylan has a deeper voice. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> well, yeah, Mark so Hind was his owner. That's true. So yeah. That's what he learned. That's true. <clears throat> He's funny. So is today a Theo day or? Theo's upstairs. Theo's upstairs. Oh, okay. So, so, so we, can go, we can go peek through the door up there. Sure. And, mm-hmm. and see him real quick. Yeah. Well, we talked about him out there. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. We can have some um, real quick and cool. see some of those guys. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I haven't seen Sassy in a long time. I'll get your Sassy welcome. I'll get my Sassy welcome. Thank you. And so then we did. We went upstairs, and Theo, we were going to look in a window, but guess what? Theo was out on his leash being adorable and getting some enrichment. So I got to meet Theo and a bunch of the other ambassador animals at Adventure Aquarium. Y'all, that facility took such amazing care of me. I am so thankful to Lauren for setting all of this up and uh, for for talking to the higher ups and convincing them to trust me with this huge five episode project. And um, in the process of the two days of interviews and meeting animals and all the crazy stuff, also becoming my friend. Um, Lauren and I are buds now and I just, I love that so much. And I want to thank everybody uh, who was a guest on the podcast and um I want to thank all of the animals for being amazing, meeting hippos and sea turtles and seeing sharks and and meeting porcupines and just, ah, what an insane, insanely cool experience uh, this five-episode arc with Adventure Aquarium turned out to be. Um, Just thank you to everyone involved. And please, if you are listening to this and you have not yet, make sure that you are going to AdventureAquarium.com and following along on Facebook and Insta and on TikTok at Adventure Aquarium. They have so much great content. I am am so impressed with this place and so proud to not only feature them on the podcast, but to be a member at Adventure Aquarium and, and call it My Aquarium. Because it's totally my aquarium. All right, y'all. Um, I'm going to leave it at that. And uh, thanks for being here. And my final thing that I have to say to you is that the word credit, when spoken by a hippo, is... Get it? Because you can't hear the noise that they make because they vocalize lower than we can hear. Anyway, the Ross Safari Podcast is produced, hosted, and engineered by John Rossi. Editing and fact-checking by John and Dr. Zoe Vesley Gross. Our theme song is Sevens by Nathan Burke, performed by Nathan and John. Interrupting John theme and additional voices by Taylor Isaac Gray. You can reach John directly on Instagram and Facebook at Ross Safari or by email at rossafaripod at gmail.com. Ross Safari is part of the Daydreamer Media Network. Now, stop listening to me and go visit a zoo.